Welcome to Visions of Victory, our weekly broadcast of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Springhouse, Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us where we remember the words of the Psalmist David. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So sit back and relax because the next voice you'll hear is that of our pastor, Charles W. Kwan. I ask that you would turn with me uh, to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we've already read a great deal of this passage, and I just want to share with you uh, for the sake of the message on today from verses 4 and 5. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our passage for today was written uh, by Peter himself. Peter was one of the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. Peter was a hot-headed, ear-slashing former fisherman uh, who came to be acknowledged as the first, first pope uh, by the Catholic Church. Peter had a very interesting journey. He was one uh, of three disciples that witnessed the transfiguration. He walked on water, he confessed Jesus, and then later denied Jesus, uh, not one, but three times. Uh, Peter's life story is told in the Gospels as well as in uh, the book of Acts. If you remember, uh, it was Peter that preached when the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2, and 3,000 souls uh, were added on that day. If you remember, uh, it was Peter that had a conversation with Jesus in Matthew 16, and upon his recognition by way of divine revelation, Jesus declared, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, Jesus was essentially saying to Peter that this was his mission. This was his idea. He was saying, I will put together my church. I will gather a chosen group of people and nothing will be able to break them apart. I somehow believe that Peter's experiences in Acts chapter 2 and Matthew 16 fueled his experience when writing 1st and 2nd Peter. Uh, he encouraged the church to hope in Christ and to be faithful for Jesus was sure to return. He wanted us to understand our power, our privilege, and our responsibility as we are a part of the church of Jesus Christ. It is important to note that the church is not just a building put together by brick and mortar. We don't just come to church, we are the church. We are a part of the church local, but we are also a part of the church universal. All believers were worldwide and we are the church individual. The hymn writer says, the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is a people. He goes on to say, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together, all who follow Jesus, all around the world. Yes, we are the church together. The church is so much more than weekly worship. We don't just come at one time and leave at another. We are the church and we take the church wherever we go. The church is still the church even when we're not holding an official meeting. And we have to be ever mindful of this if we are going to ignite the vision for BBC. In order to be successful, you have to buy into the idea that our vision is more than just words on a paper or words visible on a screen or something printed on the back of our church bulletin. This is not something that we have to do because pastor said so. It's, not some, it's something that God has spoken through pastor and we are charged to obey, not grudgingly, not hesitantly, but willingly and obediently. We do so because we realize that God did not have to choose us, but he chose to out of his love and his grace and his mercy to allow us to carry out his work. As the old saints say, he's God all by himself and he don't need nobody's help. 
God can work alone. But as I said, because of his love for us, he allows us to journey alongside him as agents and ambassadors. An ambassador, the word of God lets us know that we are ambassadors for Christ. And an ambassador is one that works on behalf of another. Because of his grace, he placed a treasure in earthen vessels. We've got to know that God is counting on you and he's counting on me. I am and you are the key to the success of Bethlehem's vision. We cannot ignite the vision lest you help us to strike the match. Before I take my seat, there are just a few things that I want to share with you on today. We've got to know that God has wonderful plans for us. God has greater plans for us than we could ever imagine. Before Jesus left his earthly mission, he said to the disciples, greater works will you do. If you think about this, Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. He caused the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the dumb to talk. But even with all that he accomplished, he told his disciples, that you will do even greater works. We have so much power placed inside of us as children of Jesus Christ. We so many times come to church and the power of God is moving. The presence of God is there. God's healing power is moving through the place and we're just content with business as usual. We're ready for the next thing on the program and sometimes God wants to break through and do something different. Sometimes God wants, and that's what I love about Pastor because he's not always concerned about the next thing. If somebody needs prayer, he'll stop and pray for them. And we have to be open to this. We have to be open to the greater work that God wants to do in our midst. As we said, even with all that God allowed Jesus to accomplish here on earth, as I said, he told the disciples that they would do even greater works. In this passage, Peter helps us to understand our identity as the church and our responsibility in the church. In order to make this explanation live for us, he likens our experience with Jesus Christ to a spiritual house built with Jesus as the chief cornerstone and us as the living stones. Jesus is the center and the, and the, and the beginning of all that we do. We don't work on our own. We don't do what we want to do, but Jesus is the one that holds us together. Jesus is the one that keeps our foundation sure. So let us look very quickly to the tools that will help us to build this spiritual house. We've got to know, uh, verse 4 says, coming to him as a living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. We've got to know that just as God chose Jesus, God chose us. And we've got to know that we are not the architects, nor are we the builders of this house. Verse 4 reminds us again that we are chosen by God, that we are precious, and we've got to know to be chosen or to be called means a, a claim on a person's time or life. It means to be selected by God. It means to be summoned. It means to be taken out of circulation. So we no longer belong to the world. We belong to God. We We've got to know that the all-sovereign one beckoned us to work for him. We are on assignment to build God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We've got to know that God's will must be done. And out of all the people in the world, he chose you. He called your name. He singled you out. He chose you to work for him. Man may have rejected you or be, or you may be rejected right now, but God chose you. Your parents may have rejected you, but God claims you. God owns you. You've got to know that you are an ambassador of Christ and you are, you work according to his agenda. Your life is no longer your own. It's not about what you think or what you feel works best for you. It's not about where you want to live or where you want to work or what kind of car you want to drive, but you've got to know that God's calling has claimed your life and your time. You are here on assignment and this should help you to work amidst confusion and criticism. You got to know that you can press forward when people hate on you and they lie on you because your assignment is to build a ki the kingdom, not to build a fan base. 
you got to know that we work to please God and not to please man. We've got to know that God is our CEO. God is our chief executive officer. He is the one that writes our performance evaluations. He is the source of promotion for us. When you are at your job, you don't look to your coworkers for direction or instruction. You look to your boss. It would be nice if your coworkers like you, but you don't go to work to, to please everybody. You don't go to work to make friends. You go to work because you have an assignment. You go to work to do what the boss wants you to do. And that's how it is for us here at the church. We've got to know that we are married to the work. Too many of us are on ministries because our friends are on them. And instead of moving the kingdom agenda forward, it's become a social club. It's become a clique. And instead of listening to God through our pastor, some carry out their own plans. I understand what pastor said, but. I hear what pastor wants us to do, but. I know what pastor said, but. Some of us are on ministries because there's status attached to it. But status does not give us our validation. Our calling gives us validation. You've got to know that you're operating in your calling and fulfilling your purpose. And that's what gives you peace of mind. That's what gives you joy unspeakable. And when you're working in your purpose, you have passion. And even from your purpose comes your provision. Some of us don't have what we need because we're not working in our purpose. We're in the left lane and God wants us in the right lane. We got off on exit 27 and God wants us off on exit 29. We've got to work in our calling. We've got to learn how to stay in our lanes. We've got to learn how to bloom where we're planted. We've got to seek God for clarity in our calling. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean it's your gift. Just because you can sing doesn't necessarily mean that you should be on the choir. Just because you can sing doesn't necessarily mean that you should be on the praise team. Being a, a, a leader in the praise team means that you should not just stand in front of people in worship, but worship should be a part of your lifestyle. Worship should be something that you do at home. Worship but should be something that you're preparing for. Just because you can stand at a door doesn't mean you should be an usher. Because when we enter through the door, the ushers help us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And sometimes we come to church and we're broken down, we're discouraged, and we're disheartened. And you need somebody with the gift of hospitality greeting you at the door. You need somebody with a smile greeting you at the door. You need somebody with a prayer in their heart meeting you at the door. You don't need somebody at the door with their corns hurting. As you know, if your feet hurt, everything else hurts, and you're more than likely not going to have a good attitude. So if my father were here, he would say, if your corns are hurting, just sit down today. It's okay. But you stand at the door knowing that God has called you to be here. A cleaning up the church is not just something that you do for a paycheck. God has trusted you to keep his house clean, to keep his house in order. We've got to be called to do something. Just because you can preach doesn't mean you've been called to pastor. you got to be called to do this work. We don't lead ministries just because we want president or ministry leader next to our name. We don't lead ministries just because we want to be the first to do this or the only one to do that. We lead because God has called us to lead. We've got to also make sure that our voice doesn't overshadow the voice of God because there are some times that we want things so badly that we'll allow our desire to overshadow God's desire. And if we're not careful, our desire will become our disaster. 
Everybody is not called to be a pastor's wife. Everybody is not called to be an armor bearer. You, you don't become an armor bearer just because you want to bring the pastor a piece of chicken. You know that you're called to do this. You do this because God has entrusted you to help to make the pastor's job easy. It's more than just bringing a banana or some milk. It's about helping the pastor's job to be just a little bit easy. It's about making sure that he's fed and fueled and nourished when he stands up to preach the word, when he's counseling a member. You've got to be called to do this work. We are all different parts with different roles, and yet the beauty is in the diversity. We uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't church be boring if we all sang on the choir or if we all sat in the pew. Church would be very boring. So the Bible tells us to pray earnestly for the best gifts. And when you're open, God will give you what he wants you to have. And then and only then will the church grow. Then and only then will lives be changed. I remember there were so many, if it were up to me, Pastor, I would be teaching, teaching school uh, or, or, or being a lawyer uh, with 2.5 kids and a dog and a house on the hill right about now. Uh, but God closed those doors. He, he, he shut them sometimes even in my face because that was my plan for my life. That was what I wanted to do. So God closed those doors so he can open the door to what he had for me to do. So we've got to know that we're called, but then we've got to also know that we are connected. Verse 5 says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. So we are living stones. And just as with this physical building, every stone is necessary and every stone is held together because of the stone next to it. If one stone is missing, it may not be readily obvious, but it will eventually need to be be repaired or replaced for the structure of the building will then be at stake just as each stone is necessary to physically build God's house we are living stones and are necessary to build the spiritual house each of us is a necessary part of the whole the church is the sum of many parts and each of you here today make up our church. You are an essential part of the church. Everyone has a role and should be functioning in it. Uh, if you don't do your part, your work, if you don't operate and you won't be operating at maximum capacity, you will hinder the work of the church. The kingdom will ultimately suffer. We've, we know that we are connected. Everything works together. Our hand knows what to touch because the eye helps it to see. Every organ in our body has a function, and they can work because they work together. We are all different parts with different roles, and the beauty, as I said, is in the diversity. Church would be very boring if we all sang on the choir or if we all sat in the pew. Our diverse gifts make, make way for a diverse experience. I remember during the anniversary celebration, Deacon Tom, uh, in his own uniqueness, uh, shared with us an announcement uh, about the church anniversary. He uh, picked up the telephone as if he was on the phone with someone, and because uh, he was not content with doing what everybody else did, the way everybody else did it, it helped me even months later to remember this announcement because he was operating in his unique gifts. So we uh, can't get upset when someone doesn't do what we want them to do or like uh, we've done it in the past. We've got to receive our differences with love. A uh, God placed a piece of him inside of each of us and it manifests itself 
differently. But the key in all of this is to stay connected. Pastor can be pastor because he has people to pastor. I can serve because I have people to serve. The choir can sing because they have a congregation to minister to. Each of our gifts is connected to another. You may have a prayer on your lips that will help to usher in somebody's deliverance. So that's why it's important for you to remain connected. It's why it's important for you to be present because somebody is depending on what God has placed inside of you. If you're absent or out of place, they simply won't get it. You should work so purposefully that if you're, that if you're absent, it's obvious when you're not here, uh, when I'm not here, I hope you miss me when I'm gone. I know that the office is not the office is not the same when pastor's not there. We've got to work in such a way that you're missed when you're gone. Or even worse, you don't want people to be glad that you're gone. You should be so intricately involved. I know a couple of people like that, but they don't belong to Bethlehem. <laughs> You should be so intricately involved that your presence is missed. The church should not be the same when your stone is missing. I remember, uh, I believe it was last week or two weeks ago, Brother Dow was missing. The music ministry did go on, but I missed him being here because he has an active role in Bethlehem. So when we're not here, we should be missed. We shouldn't have to scratch our heads to figure out who you are or where where you are. It should not be enough to just have your name on the roll. You have a function and you should be functioning. So lastly, we know that we're called, we're connected, but lastly, we've got to know that we are committed. The word says that we are holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The text talks about offering up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. So we've got to know that igniting the vision is a commitment and not a convenience. We've got to know that it's not about doing it when we feel like it and staying home when we please. When you realize that you're called to do something and others are connected to your calling, you are compelled to be committed. The kingdom works and growing Bethlehem, working the kingdom and growing Bethlehem is a sacrifice. You've got to work when people are with you and work when you're working by yourself. You have to work when they appreciate you and work when they forget that you're even working. You've got to sometimes work even harder to serve the unlovable. You've got to serve sacrificially. You've got to serve those that want to be helped and even those ones that don't know they need to be helped. You've got to choose not to be in and out and up and down. Here one Sunday and out two Sundays. You've got to commit to be present, knowing that you're not working unto man or just working unto Bethlehem, the building. But you've got to work knowing that you're working unto God and your sacrifice has got to be pleasing unto God. I don't want my service to smell like laziness. I don't want my service to smell like slothfulness. I don't want my service to smell like an ill attitude. When I offer my service unto God, I want it to be a sweet smelling sacrifice. I want him to know that I appreciate him calling me to share his word. I want him to know that I appreciate him trusting me to stand over people and to pray over their loved ones Then, when they're in their last few days of this life. I want God to know that I'm grateful for what he's called me to do. I want him to know that even though he could have chose somebody else or chosen to work without me, that he chose me and where of I am glad. Right. 
We've got to ask how we can serve our church, not how the church can serve you. There's a study that I read not too long ago, and when people uh, were looking for a church, they wanted to know what time was service, how long did they stay in service, if they had a daycare, if they had an exercise club, how many offerings they took. The church is not a country club. We don't come to be served. We come to serve. Some people are only around for what they can get, but we've got to choose not to be like that. We've got to find our calling and make our commitment. We've got to give abundantly. We've got to serve lovingly. And as I said, not unto man, but as unto the Lord. Your commitment is a sign of your surrender. What you're essentially saying is that your life is not your own. To God, you belong. You are in God's army now, and there's no honorable discharge or early retirement. You've got to give the work all you've got. You've got to put your hand to it and you've got to put your heart to it. you got to know that the church will be blessed and you will be blessed in the process. There is no greater feeling than knowing that you're where God wants you to be doing what God wants you to do. You can go to bed at night and sleep good. You can wake up with purpose on your mind, even though you may be tired, even though you may not feel like getting up. You know it's bigger than your physical body. You know purpose lives inside of you, so purpose should wake you up in the morning. Purpose should get you out of bed. Purpose should get you dressed and get you in the house of the Lord with the song of David on your lips. I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. So I want to share with you a story as I prepare to take my seat. And then I want to share with you something that will help you with a self-assessment. There's a famous story from Sparta. And a Spartan king boasted to a visiting monarch about the walls of Sparta. The visiting monarch looked around and could see no walls. He said to the Spartan king, where are the walls in which you boast about so much? His host pointed at his bodyguard and the magnificent troops. These, he said, are the walls of Sparta. Every man is a brick. As long as a brick lies by itself, it is useless. It only becomes of use when it is incorporated into a building. So as an individual, to achieve your destiny, you must not remain alone, but must be built into the fabric of the church. I am Bethlehem. You are Bethlehem. We are Bethlehem. So I, la I leave with you this question. If your relationship with God were a spiritual building, what would it look like? Would your shutters be falling down? Would the roof be in need of repair? Would your foundation be destroyed? Would the paint be chipping on the walls? Does the furniture need to be renovated or replaced? Or does your relationship with... We hope you've been inspired and encouraged by today's message. You're invited to visit us at Bethlehem Baptist, a warm multicultural church with two Sunday services, 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. We're located in Springhouse, Pennsylvania at Penland Pike and Dager Road, only 15 minutes from Philadelphia. We hope to see you soon. God bless you and remember, love God, serve people.